Howdy and welcome to the 10-week Bible study. This is week nine, day one of our study of the book of Daniel. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're looking at Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Welcome back to the 10-week Bible study. I am your host, Darren Hibbs, and today we're going to be looking at Daniel chapter 11. This is probably one of the most formidable and important chapters in all of the book of Daniel, and it's the reason, this chapter is the reason why many, if not most, modern scholars believe that Daniel was written after the fact, not as a book of prophecy, but as a book of historical writings and kind of trying to fit circumstances and things to what had already happened. Most people find this so incredulous because this chapter and a half here coming up are the most precise and detailed prophecy in all of Scripture. And again, most theologians, most theologians who don't believe in either God or the authenticity of the Bible, things like that, they look at this and they say, it's not possible. This is not possible for anyone to know all of this in such detail beforehand. But you and I know, if you're following along here, that this is not hard for God. This is not a hard thing for God to speak to someone what's going to happen in the near and distant future. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and pray before we jump in today. Lord, would you open our eyes and our ears to hear what your word has to say to us, God? Speak to us. Fill our hearts with the knowledge of you. We want to commune with you and fellowship with you in your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, before we jump into God's Word, I just want to say uh, thank you to all of the people who've been praying for my voice. Um, For those of you that are following along, it's been a while now. My voice has just been wrecked for a long time, and it's finally, after weeks, coming back to normal. So those of you that have been praying for me, I appreciate it. Uh, Thank you. Please continue to pray for me if you, you think about me, because Uh, I I don't know what's going on, why this has been happening so much, but I've lost my voice uh, a great number of times over the last year and a half. So maybe it's an attack of the enemy. Maybe I'm doing something wrong, and I'd like to figure that out. But at any rate, I appreciate those who are praying, and we're back, and hopefully I'll be back for a while now. All right, jumping back into Daniel 11, let's go ahead and start reading in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. I'll be reading, as always, from the NIV. In the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. Pausing right there. This is the angel uh, who has been sent to um, Daniel to to speak to him and give him all this. So chapter 10 was really the preamble. It's the angel coming and explaining all of the the behind-the-scenes spiritual warfare stuff and giving him a little bit of background information over what's going on telling him, hey, uh, this is really important um, because even the archangel Michael had to come help me uh, to give this to you. And and so um, this is this angel speaking here. And so some people put verse 1 at the end of chapter 10, and some people obviously here, the NIV, puts it at the beginning of chapter 11. And this is where you get into kind of the nuance of translation because there are no chapter and verses in the original text. You had to know everything by context. So the people that uh, did the chapters and verses a long time ago, they were done at different times. But when they did it, uh, they this is the way they chose to do it. And some people disagreed. But anyway, that's kind of getting into the weeds. Moving on, verse 2. Now then, I tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth, who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has arisen, his empire will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. So we've just said a whole lot right there. I mean, an an incredible amount. We've gone through... uh, two of the mightiest empires in human history in just two verses, three verses, excuse me. We're talking about the Persian kingdom. And so this angel 
<clears throat> and one of the interesting things to note here is this is different from all of the other revelations that Daniel has received. Daniel is not being given some vision or anything like that. The angel is very plainly speaking these things to him and making it very clear what's going to happen. And so all Daniel has to do is take notes. And I kind of wonder, you know, in the midst of this, is the angel, you know, did he leave this out, but was the angel telling him stuff? And he's like, wait, 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 get, get a pad of paper or something. You need to write this down. You know, I, I can't imagine that Daniel would have remembered all this stuff. So I just, I wonder, you know, was Daniel kind of awestruck by what's going on? And eventually the angel's like, wait, 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 stop, stop. I'm going I'm to start over here because you're not going to get all this, get a pad of paper. I'll, I'll wait a second and, and write all this down. That's, didn't happen in the Bible. That's just my commentary, my thoughts on it. I, I look at that and I, I wonder how he, he got this so clearly. Um, <clears throat> anyway, what we've got here is we've got the Persian kingdom and we're told right off the bat, there's going to be three more kings and then there's going to be a fourth who's going to be far richer and greater and powerful and he's going to go off and he's going to mess with Greece. And so we call this person, uh, I believe uh, Xerxes, and in I'm going to be honest with you as we go through this passage. I'm not going to give you a timeline. There's not going to be some giant graphic behind me that outlines all of the kingdoms and their animals and what it all means and all that kind of stuff. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing. That's just not the point of what we're doing here. Um, <clears throat> it's It's important to understand a little bit about what's going on here. But more than anything, I don't want to just relay Bible knowledge and Bible information to you. I want to go through this in such a way that it increases your fascination and my fascination with God's word. And so we're not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to get super detailed. Um, there's like a billion Google searches you can do to find everyone's different take on this. But for the most part, I'm going to hit the high points here on who these people are and why it's important. But I'm not going to go into a lot of the nitty gritty details because there's a lot of nitty gritty details in the history of these kingdoms behind what's going on here. And number one, uh, honestly, it's really confusing unless you're an avid historian in kind of the ancient Middle Eastern history because all of the the different things that are going on, it's really fascinating. It really is. But uh, unless you're fascinated with it, it gets really confusing really quickly who was where and why and what. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip over most of that. And those of you that are interested enough, fascinated enough, um, again, a quick Google search, just type in Daniel chapter 11 and you'll be confronted with a lot of information on who all of these people are. But that's not what I'm going for here. All right, so the high points is, uh, you know, Xerxes, he goes and messes with Greece. And there's lots of, you know, stories and even movies about those encounters between Persia and Greece and the wars that they fought. Eventually, uh, Persia becomes less. They lose. Greece rises and Alexander the Great becomes the king of Greece. He starts the Macedonian Empire, better known as the Greek Empire. And so that's what we're talking about here. So after Alexander the Great arises, he actually <clears throat> conquers by the age of 30 more than anybody had ever conquered in human history. And he was actually in the city of Babylon, the uh, the kingdom city of Babylon when he died. He went into a drunken stupor and somehow died. And it's not exactly clear why or how he died, but he died in Babylon of all places. So then his kingdom gets parceled out to four deputies, if you will. And uh, they're kind of spread around his kingdom. The two most important from that kingdom that get parceled out are really going to be the leader of Egypt and the leader of Syria, because they're going to be the ones that are going to be in conflict over the Holy Land. And keep in mind that everything that we're being told here, it's not about kingdoms and rulers of the earth. It's about the ones that specifically touch or occupy or oppress God's holy people, the Israelites, the Jews in Israel and Jerusalem specifically. So all of this is pointed toward kingdoms 
and 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 events that are taking place that that have uh, interest to the city of Jerusalem because it is the eternal city of Jerusalem. As far as we know, it's the only eternal city. It's the only one that exists on earth now and that will exist forever. So that's why that's important to this story. So the, the kingdom gets parceled out and then we're going to kind of forget about the kings of the, the east and the west and we're going to focus on the kings of the north and the south moving forward because they're going to be the ones that are going to collide and collapse upon the city of Jerusalem. Verse five, the king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger than he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. After some years, they will become allies. The daughter of the king of the south will go to the king of the north to make an alliance, but she will not retain her power and he and his power will not last. In those days, she will be betrayed together with her royal escort and her father and the one who supported her. Um, I'm embarrassed right now because I just forgot the names of of these women. The one woman who gets brought in for these political alliances is named Bernice, and she was a Ptolemy's daughter in the South Kingdom of Egypt. And um, <clears throat> so maybe like along the bottom, if you're watching the video or somewhere here and the links, um, or again, Google, you can find this and get all of the detailed information. Um, one of the reasons I don't normally go into a lot of detail is because I end up forgetting <laughs> uh, without good notes here, uh, all these things, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. So there's lots of good information on the history behind this. I encourage you to check that out if you're interested enough. Otherwise, just stay with us here in the text of the Bible. So there's all of this intrigue with these two women and the kingdoms, and one of them takes over, and eventually she's betrayed, and, and everything is very tumultuous. That's that's the idea we're getting here is, is there's not this uh, powerful dynasty that's unchallenged throughout all of this. There's a lot of unrest, and that is what is normal, and I want to focus on that. All of this unrest and upheaval, that's normal human interaction, especially when you're talking about kings and kingdoms. Nobody ever in human history has had complete and total power and dominion over everything. It's never happened. And spoiler alert, it will never happen. Many people, and, and what we're going to get into later on is the end time stuff. When we're talking about the Antichrist and all these kingdoms and things like that, many people have in their mind this idea that the Antichrist is going to reign supreme over all of the earth and all people on the earth. And whereas some scriptures can kind of give you that idea, it's actually not true. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. He will have more power, more authority, and, and more governance than anybody else in human history. That's very clear from scripture. But he will never occupy or oppress or control all of the earth at one time. Now, maybe at different times he will, that's a little bit unclear, but this is going to make it very clear that even his kingdom is going to be tumultuous and changing and evolving. And so a lot of people have this mentality that the, and when the Antichrist comes, it's going to be just crazy. And it is, it absolutely is, but it's going to still look like real life. It's going to look like what has been normative and normal throughout human history. That's the sense that we need to get from this. And all of this, we're being told, Daniel's being told that there's going to be all of this tumult and all of this turnover and all of this craziness. All right, verse seven. One from her family line will arise and take her place. He will attack the forces of the king of the north and enter his fortress. He will fight against them and be victorious. He will also seize their gods, their metal images, and their valuable articles of silver and gold and carry them off to Egypt. For some years, he will leave the king of the north alone. Then the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will retreat to his own country. His sons will pre prepare for war and assemble a great army, which will sweep on like an irresistible flood and carry the battle as far as his fortress. Okay. We're going to stop for right there because that's enough of all of this north and south. And again, we're talking about the uh, Seleucid kingdom versus the Ptolemaic kingdom. That's the kind of what these two kingdoms are called. And because Ptolemy was one of the deputies of Alexander the Great that took over Egypt and uh, Seleucus or whoever it was took over 
the Syrian Empire area. And so these are these two kingdoms that are fighting. What's going to get really complicated here is that eventually we're going to kind of meander and meld this idea of the king of the north and the king of the south into the end times. And there's not going to be a real clear line of demarcation for when that happens and what the angel is saying. That makes this chapter very difficult to process. And it's one of those things that makes non-believing, or I don't want to say the people that don't believe that the Bible is authoritative or Christian or anything like that. I'm just saying people that don't believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God. And they look at this and they say, impossible someone wrote this hundreds of years later, like 160 AD as opposed to 500 or 400 something AD when I believe that this was written. And most scholars who believe that this is a book of prophecy would have believed that it was written. Um, most of these people say it's not possible for anyone to know all this and to have all of this so detailed because this is incredibly accurate. And again, I'm not doing the history of this justice. I'm encouraging you to jump into other sources to go through the history because that's reading about this kind of stuff is going to be a lot more um, informative if you're interested in that. What I want to do is is point out here how detailed this is and the theme here that the angel is giving Daniel is that it's all very tumultuous. He's talking about a very long period of time already, and it's going to get even longer until the end times. The angel is going to make it clear that by the end of this, he's talking about the end times before Jesus returns, before the Messiah comes back. But we're seeing it's it's almost like this flood moving down a river and all of these rocks are tumbling along the bottom of the river. That's how world history works. This is all this, this tumult and all of this human craziness that starts wars and borders change and all of these things, that's normal. We as Americans and Westerners, um, e even like Westerners in Europe, know that this is true. Americans have not felt this in a very long time. Our borders have not been challenged. Our borders have not really changed other than mild expansion in the last hundred years. <clears throat> Our borders have been set. But most people throughout human history have experienced during their lifetime at least some change in the borders and alliances of nations, and, and it actually affects their daily lives. We haven't felt that as Americans, per se. And, and, and a, a higher percentage of planet Earth in the last probably 50 years have not felt that. But there's still a lot of changing borders. I mean... If, if you've graduated high school and you have any time under your belt, you know that the map that you were taught, the world map that you were taught in school, in elementary school, is not the map of the world today. It's constantly changing. It just hasn't changed for us. And so we don't personally feel like we're one of these rocks, giant boulders tumbling along the bottom <coughs> of this mountain river during a flash flood. But that is the sense that we get from what's going on here. It's imperfect, it's human, and it's crazy. And I'm sure as Daniel's being told all of this, he's like, oh my gosh, like, what are you even saying to me? I, I have no idea what he's talking about because now he's talking about, you know, Persia, which is the kingdom he's in. He was just in the kingdom of Babylon. Now you're telling me it's going to be Greece and there's going to be North and South. I'm sure Daniel's head is absolutely spinning and he's a smart guy. Daniel's an incredibly smart guy. We were told that early on. Like, if anyone can grasp what's going on, it's Daniel. And he's going to tell us, I got no clue with any of this. He's going to tell the angel, like, I have no idea what you just said to me. And the angel's like, you know, chapter 12, he's going to be like, don't, don't worry about it, Daniel. It's not actually for you. I just need you to write this down and put it on the shelf to make sure that your people have access to this for when they need it. Because the important part of this prophecy is not what's going to come with the Persian Empire or the Greek Empire or the Roman Empire. None of that actually matters. All of that stuff is just important for the readers, for us, and for the Jews during this time period to have on hand to know that the last part, which is the important part, which is the theme throughout the book of Daniel, 
that the angels have been revealing to him, the last part, the end times, the part where the Antichrist is going to come and oppress God's people. That's the important part. All of the rest of this stuff is just to build their faith that it's true, that it's going to happen, and that they need to be able to hold on during that time period and stay faithful to the one true God because it's going to be really hard. That's the point of all of this. All of these kings and kingdoms, they're faith builders. And when we look back at this, we have the decision to make. Do we believe this is a book of prophecy? Or do we believe it's a faked book of history masquerading as a book of prophecy? I believe it's a book of prophecy because it's giving us short-term or shorter-term information about these kingdoms that are going to arise to give us faith that, that it was spoken on the front end, that God knows what's going on, to give us faith to believe the message at the end of it that hasn't yet happened. And a great many times in scripture, that's exactly how things work, is there's a, a now and not yet aspect of biblical prophecy. And that's how the, the Lord works in a lot of ways. Like when we talk about the kingdom of God, Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom of God. You're saying it's here, it's among you. But at the same time, there's tons of scriptures that talk about the coming kingdom of God when we're with God in eternity. And so there's a here but not yet aspect of the kingdom of God and biblical prophecy in general is we know a little bit, but we haven't seen everything. We'll get into that a little bit more tomorrow when we continue in this chapter. But for today, that's all we've got. I'm your host, Darren Hibbs, for the 10-week Bible study. I can't wait to see you next time.